everybody. This is Mel Allen. Coming up on This Week in Baseball, Cincinnati keeps up a century-old tradition and opens the season with all the usual flair. Seattle's hidden charm. Hey, excuse me, Peter, are those towels ready yet? Tell me five more minutes. And in Baltimore, fears are put to rest as a presidential kickoff sets the Orioles off on the right foot. But don't worry, be happy. Opening day's all on This Week in Baseball. Brought to you by Miller Lite. When it's Miller Lite, less filling tastes great. The Queen City, Cincinnati, Ohio. Decked out for the 105th home opener in blazing Cincinnati red and complete with all the trimmings fit for the National League's traditional opener. So with everyone in their places, the festivities began. Kicking off the season in Cincinnati is a custom not to be tampered with. Well, there should be a tradition, and they're getting away with it. A couple teams opened last year before opening day. You know, they took our opening day away from us there in the American League. I think it was Detroit. And uh, we feel that everybody ought to stop and wait for Cincinnati. Oh, this is it. The baseball season doesn't start. This is the first day of spring. This is it. This is the official first day of spring. It's my first experience ever. I mean, there's nothing like the feeling of coming down here as opening day. And it's an extra special day for new first baseman Todd Benzinger. You see, he grew up in Cincinnati, as did fellow Reds Ron Oster and Barry Larkin. And now they're playing for the team they used to root for. A lot of memories. You know, I was 12 or 13 when they were winning the World Series, and um, I was as big a fan as anybody. I never made it down to an opening day, though, but I was down here 20, 25 times a year with my dad. Well, a sellout crowd filled up Riverfront Stadium to see the world champs open the season against the Reds. It's a day that comes, though, with a few cases of the jitters. This is what everybody waits for. Uh, you work hard all spring. Everybody believes they're going to finish number one. Everybody believes that they're going to have a great year. And now is going to be the, the start of what uh, we hope and pray will be a very successful year. Pete Rose was no doubt equally optimistic, even though he remained under a cloud of suspicion for betting on baseball. Still, Rose looked his usual unflappable self and got some hearty support from the fans. Still in my heart, Pete Rose is Pete Rose, and he's Mr. Cincinnati, and he always will be. We don't even talk about it in the clubhouse. We read about it like everybody else does in the mornings. Once we put down the paper and um, get out in the field, we don't think about it at all. So it's not going to be any, any kind of a distraction for any of the players, and I can speak for all of them. We really don't think too much about it. Rose's troubles aside, it was time to play ball. But first, a new Hall of Famer and former member of the Big Red Machine was on hand to throw out the first pitch. That done, Johnny Bench turned the Reds over to Rose, and Cincinnati Bats turned the Dodgers into losers. For starters, Paul O'Neill went four for four. And watch this one. And it is gone. Three run home Great opening day excitement. And we'll give O'Neill an extra L for that. And that's the way he really spells it. It sparked Cincinnati to a comeback against the world champions, put a two run lead into the trusty hands of last season's National League save leader, John Franco. Franco saved it, and the Reds got their seventh straight opening day win. Oh, yeah, it feels always good you know, to get that first one out of the way and uh, you know, we beat the world champions, and hopefully we just continue. Last year, we didn't do too well against them, but uh, you know we got off on the right foot. team came back real well, and uh, you know, there's one down. you gotta got to get the first one to get to that second one. You know, it's always a big thing in Cincinnati opening day, especially being from Cincinnati. Yeah. 
you know, it's tradition. The uh, city makes the festival out of the whole thing. Uh, at the big old parade today, and it was just a picture-perfect day. For Barry Larkin and the Reds, but not for L.A. You know, they've done so well on opening days the last seven or eight years. Uh, but last year, we started out with a loss, so I guess you could say we're right on track, even though we would have chosen to win if we could. Last year, the Baltimore Orioles were the team that couldn't. When Frank Robinson jumped aboard on April 12th, the Orioles had already lost six in a row. Three weeks later, they still had not posted a win and went in the record books, having lost their first 21 games. No team in the American League has ever lost more consecutively than the Baltimore Orioles. It wasn't as tough on me as people think it was. I don't like losing any more than I have at any other time, and when I uh, enjoy losing, it's time to get out of the game. But what kept me going last year was the players, the way they went about their jobs. They tried. And uh, we were just short on a little uh, talent here and there. We knew why we were losing, because we weren't getting the pitching one day, we weren't getting the hitting or the defense. Eddie Murray, longtime star of the Orioles, is now with the Dodgers, leaving Cal Ripken the leading power source for Baltimore. In exchange for Murray, the Orioles acquired pitcher Brian Holton, who's making the switch from first place to last. Last season, when we won it all, I think it made the transition easier for me. Because you know, I've already, I got a World Series ring, and I think that's what a lot of ball players' goal is, is to get a World Series ring. And I've got one, and now I'm on a rebuilding team, and you know, we got a lot of young guys, and I think that we're going to be okay. Brian brings experience to this ball club, and we're liking in that respect. Uh, he brings also championship uh, experience that he's been through a, a championship race, been in a World Series, and I think uh, the young players can learn from watching him. Holton may have plenty of students since Baltimore has the major's youngest team. In fact, there are only two Orioles over the age of 30. One of them, Dave Schmidt. See, I'm young for baseball, but I'm old for this team. Like all Orioles, Schmidt is eager to forget last season's 107 losses and get Baltimore back on its feet. We set some records last year for all the wrong reasons. We, we, we set the record for losing to begin the season, and. And we got a lot of uh, attention and publicity for losing, and we'd like to try to get some attention and publicity this year for turning it around. So, with thoughts of last year's troubles put to rest, the Orioles opened the season to a packed house at Memorial Stadium. President George Bush threw out the first pitch. But for some bird lovers, the president's visit brought back other troubling memories. Well, if you're an Orioles fan, you'd probably not too excited about that because uh, at least in the Reagan presidency whenever he came to the stadium and threw out the first ball or even just showed up the Orioles invariably lost opening day also brought out local DJ Bob Rivers who last season stayed on the air until the O's got their first win coming out to watch a game and catch some sunshine and uh, see Rocket Roger hopefully have a bad day and uh, look at the uh, the young team and see how well they do and I brought a witch with me a, a, a real witch? Her name is Andre. Actually, she's not a witch. She has another word for it. I'm the cosmic cheerleader today. Cosmic cheerleader? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to spread energy to the fans so that the fans can spread it back to the Orioles and we can have a winning season. Cosmic or no, the energy is certainly positive. I don't foresee, you know, a start like last year ever happening. I mean, I think that was a once-in-a-lifetime thing will never be duplicated ever again. We're looking to, you know, get behind uh, what we did last year and come out and win some games this year and hopefully start things out right with by winning opening day. To do so, they would have to beat Boston's ace, Roger Clemens, who had a two-run lead in the sixth inning, but Cal Ripken changed all that. Ripken's three-run homer put Baltimore ahead. Boston tied it. And then in the 11th, with two Orioles on and one out, Joe Morgan employed some unusual strategy when he set up a five-man infield. But Craig Worthington crossed them up. The result, a 5-4 to four Baltimore win. Great relief for a team that last year didn't win its first game for almost a month. Time now for this week's quiz, brought to you by today's Chevy truck. Detroit's Jack Morris started opening day for the 10th straight time. Can you name the pitcher with the most consecutive opening day starts? 
Opening day in Oakland meant hoisting the American League pennant, then getting the new season underway for Tony La Russa and company. There were a few unusual guests at the proceedings, but nothing at all unusual from Mark McGuire, who helped beat Seattle with his first blast of 89. Fly ball deep into left field. McGuire had three RBIs altogether. As for Seattle, they got some pretty fair bashing from rookie Ken Griffey Jr., who isn't the only Griffey playing in the majors. Junior went out and did uh, exactly what he told me he was going to do this winter. He said he was going to go for it, and, you know, he went and did it. There's a drive into the gap in left center field and deep left center field, and Henderson's not going to get to it. It's off the base of the wall, and Griffey to second base in his first major league at bat, a ringing double off the 375 marker, and we have seen that all spring. Welcome to the show, Ken Griffey, Jr. Seattle also welcomes rookie manager and former A's coach Jim Lefevre, the Mariners' fifth skipper in four years. When they hired new manager, it was like, oh, okay, you know, no big deal. It's all the same here. But he has brought with him a whole new attitude and a whole new outlook. And it's something that, that really needed to be done in the organization was somebody that came in and said, hey, forget what's happened in the past. And this is the beginning. You know, with each manager, it is a new start, but nobody's really said, we're starting over. And he came in and said, we're starting over. Forget it. This is the beginning of the Seattle Mariner era. This ball club is going to be great. You wait and see. I'm going to have guys start thinking about it right now. He talks about being of singleness of mind. When, when a, a platoon goes out for war, the entire platoon has to have a singleness of mind. If the individuals are too concerned about themselves, everybody's going to get killed. Granted, we're talking about higher stakes, but it's the same principle when we go on the baseball field. If, if, if I'm concerned just about my numbers, doing a good job for me, and I'm not concerned about the other guys on the team. You lose that, that unity, that singleness of mind and a purpose on there, and that, that obviously is to win. Uh, that's what we're all out there for, is to win the pennant. You're anticipating more than that the play really was going to offer, okay? When you're that close and he hasn't committed, take a big turn, all right? Well, see, I believe this. Simplicity brings security. Security gives you confidence, and confidence brings you what? Consistency. And that's all we're looking for. By keeping it simple, the man feels secure, and that will give him the confidence to perform on a consistent basis. So you have to rehearse, rehearse, make it simple, feel secure about it, and the performance goes up. Looking for their first winning season, the Mariners didn't dare leave spring training without their good luck charm. Take it away, Mark Langston. Ah, uh, the locker room. A lot of magical things happen in this locker room. For the 1989 Seattle Mariners, we have some magic of our own. And it's Pete the Mule Fortune, a clubhouse guy. Let's go meet this young man. Here he is, Pete Fortune. Pete, do you mind if we follow you throughout the day? No, I don't mind. Great. Well, we'll be with Pete the rest of the day. One of the reasons we feel that we have such a unique person here with Pete Fortune is because he really, really gets into what he does. Pete. Excuse me. Peter, are those towels ready yet? The towels need five more minutes. The man says the towel needs five more minutes? They got to have five more minutes. This is what we're talking about. Thanks, Pete. Another one of Pete Fortune's job is he's also the assistant trainer to Rick Griffin. He has to prepare the ice for the players at the end of the game. Let's see what he's doing. Pete, how you doing today? What's the temperature in there? About that, 30 to 33. Get those ice bags ready for the players when they're done. Good job, Pete. See ya. One of Pete's ambitions is to be a PA announcer in a major league ballpark. Let's see if we can catch him. This is where he practices when he's not in the... Pete? Mind, I'm trying to Next up, number 14, center fielder Mickey Brantley. Well, I hope you enjoyed this day as much as we did with Pete the Mule Fortune. And this story does have a happy ending. Pete did get to fulfill his dream of being a PA announcer at a ballpark. And one day, maybe he'll be at a major league ballpark. Good job, Pete. Batting third, first baseman, number 21, Alvin Davis. Time now to open the notebook for this week in baseball's Twib Notes from around the majors. 
Jerry Royce of the White Sox, who turns 40 in June, began his 20th season by two hitting the Angels for seven innings and picking up the win. Royce got help from another old timer, catcher Carlton Fisk. There it goes, a home run. Combined, they're more than 80 years old, the oldest opening day battery ever. At age 41, Charlie Huff is another ageless one. Still knuckling after all these years, Huff opened the Texas Rangers season with a complete game five hitter, beating the Tigers for his first shutout since 1986. Mike Schmidt, the Phillies' great home run hitter, looked like his old swinging self at Wrigley Field when he started the season with home runs in his first two games. All that after a shoulder operation last September that almost ended his career. Time now for the answer to this week's quiz, brought to you by today's Chevy truck. Tom Seaver holds the all-time record for most consecutive opening day starts with 12. Glenn Close in the singing of our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? The National Lampham, probably best known to major leaguers, because after all, they hear it at least 162 times a year, not to mention spring training. So with all that spare time during the song, what do players think about? I try and focus on one thing, and, uh, you know, the eyes play such an important part in what we do. I try and find an object to focus on the whole time during the anthem, and uh, I'm trying to zero my concentration. What I try to do is concentrate on what I'd like to do during the ball game, uh, the opposing pitcher, uh, what he's done with me in the past, what I'd like to do against him. During national anthems, when the adrenaline really starts pumping for me, that's when I start really getting it going, and as soon as it's over with, it's, it's time. It's time to go to war. A lot of times I think about, you know, the, the, the different guys that went to war for, for the national anthem and the courage they showed and everything. It's great to uh, stand out there in your uniform, lined up in front of the dugout and see 50,000 people in the stands and, and think as to why we're all here in, in, in our great country and, and you get very patriotic. The anthem may bring out the patriot in some, but in others it seems to spark some sort of wild delusions of grandeur. During the National Anthem, I, I convinced myself how great I am and that I'm not going to make any critical errors today and that I'm the best manager in the world and that anything I do will be right no matter the outcome, so let's go. And that's why in Toronto, I, I really get pumped up with two anthems. I'm really, I'm really ready in Toronto. Fans, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Hall of Fame. In 1939, the game honored its early heroes with induction into baseball's permanent Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. This season, we'll mark the anniversary with periodic features, profiles, notes, and quotes. So let's begin with Hall of Fame sports writer and our great friend, Joe Reichler. For more than 22 years, Joe covered baseball for the Associated Press. After serving as an aide to the baseball commissioner, he helped launch This Week in Baseball. But it was the writing beat that Joe loved most of all. I covered baseball in the United States, wherever the action was. For example, when Maris and Mantle went for Babe Ruth's record simultaneously, it was tremendous news. Uh, I immediately joined him and spent about a month with the two teams. As a matter of fact, the ball players had a name for me. It might have been derisively, it might have been affectionately, I don't know. They called me the front runner. Here comes the front runner. When I would, you know, I'd join a club and I'd walk into the clubhouse and then people would look and say, hey, look who's here, Reichler, the front runner. And I would get up there, my two hind legs, and put my hands on my hips deliberately, look them all over and say, you sons of guns, you fellas should bow when I come in because when I come to you, it means that you're doing well. That's why I'm here. If you weren't doing well, I wouldn't be here. We used to kid like that, you know? Owing to Joe's passion for baseball history, he compiled more than a dozen books, most notably the definitive baseball encyclopedia. It was in 1980 that Joe received perhaps his greatest reward when he was enshrined in the sports writer's wing of the Hall of Fame. 
Well, you talk about great moments. I suppose that's the epitome for everybody. You know, no matter what field you're in, to be picked by your peers uh, as uh, among, uh, I suppose, the best, and uh, at least recognized for what contribution you might have made, and to realize that my name forever will be in a Hall of Fame, and that my children and grandchildren and friends and others would see in perpetuity. That's something that doesn't happen to everybody, so I'd be fooled to tell you that I just take it for granted. For all of Joe's memories, he was happiest with notepad in hand. I think those were the happiest moments of my life, the happiest times of my life when I was writing. Pal, we'll miss you. Time now for our Player of the Week, brought to you by Gatorade Thirst Quencher. The Yankees' 46-year-old Tommy John had been given up for old age, but on opening day against the Twins, T.J. used his age-old secrets to beat Minnesota. John hadn't figured in Dallas Green's 89 plans, but he turned out to be the team's best spring pitcher and got the opening day job. The win gave John victory number 287. Next week, we'll meet Jim Abbott, the college phenom who jumped right to the majors. That's all for now, folks. See you next week on This Week in Baseball.